Welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning into this webinar. This webinar is focused on information relating to effective meeting management, a riveting topic that we're going to touch on tonight. Over the next hour, we're going to focus our discussion on three areas. We're going to begin by discussing the types of meetings sport organizations typically have. We will then discuss meeting protocols and the core principles of Robert's Rules of Order. And then we will end by discussing effective meeting management. So my name is Lara Schrader. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm based in Saskatoon, which is located on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. I have a diploma, bachelor's, and master's degree in sport, recreation, tourism, and leisure studies, which includes a master of arts in recreation and leisure studies from the University of Waterloo, where I focused on sport organization governance. Most of my previous work has been with provincial sport organizations, but I've also held roles with several multi-sport games, and I am a trained coach and trained referee. I now own Spark Solutions, a consulting and facilitation firm that supports local, provincial, regional, and national, and recreation, national sport and recreational organizations to achieve their organizational goals in governance, strategy, and programming. As well, I sit on the board of directors with the Saskatchewan Association of Recreation Professionals. I've learned a lot about facilitating meetings, um, both in that role and my work, and I'm excited to share what I've learned with you here. Let's begin by touching on the types of meetings that you might have, annual general meetings, uh, other general meetings, board meetings, and committee meetings. We will then discuss meeting protocols, Perfect, lost my spot, yeah. Like Robert's Rules of Order. And then we will spend a lot of time discussing tips to effective meeting management. I appreciate that some of these um, tips or meetings will be less relevant to those who are from the for-profit organizations. So this first section will pertain less to you, but the second and third sections of the presentation will be more relevant. Okay, let's dig right into annual general meetings. An AGM is a meeting of the general membership of the organization. A nonprofit holds an annual general meeting each year. At an AGM, the organization's directors must present the financial statements and the auditor's report if your bylaws stipulate the use of an auditor. The AGM must be held within six months of the fiscal year end so that the financial statements can be presented. From what I read of the BC Societies Act, this is what must be done at an annual meeting. However, the AGM is often the time where directors are elected, reports are heard, and bylaw amendments are approved. Basically, you must do what your bylaws say that you will do. Minutes of the meeting must be taken. The minutes must include the date, time, location, the register of the meetings who are entitled to vote at this meeting, and the text of each resolution voted on at the meeting, the precise text. If you recall from the webinar on governing documents, the meeting minutes will be submitted along with the annual report, the financial statements, and the notice of directors to the government and kept on file at your office. Your bylaws will have rules about AGM, where the AGM can be held, what constitutes appropriate notice, and the information to be presented. Where your bylaws do not outline this, you have to follow um, the province's nonprofit legislation. And in fact, um, if you do not meet the minimum requirements to the legislation, your bylaws, um, uh, it doesn't matter what your bylaws say, you must do what the provincial legislation says. At an annual general meeting, an agenda would typically look like a call to order by the chair, a welcome and any introductions, and a roll call or reading of the register of those in attendance. The chair would then establish quorum. Quorum is the minimum number of members who must be present in order for decisions to be made and to legally transact business. The number of members you need for quorum will be established in your bylaws. Without quorum, the meeting cannot proceed. Once quorum is established, there would be an approval of the agenda and the previous meeting minutes. A number of people may be called upon to present reports and respond to questions. 
This would include a presentation of the financial and uh, financials and approving those, as well as approving the auditor, as mentioned previously. There may then be old business and new business to attend to, um, but this doesn't always happen. Then this is when the election of, for the board of directors would be held. After the election is complete, the board, uh, the AGM is typically adjourned. Organizations choose to expand their AGM to include member sessions, networking, award celebrations, and other important business. It's logical to include these items, of course, if you're traveling a distance, um, booking facilities, it makes sense to do this all at once, but these items should not be part of the annual general meeting itself. The AGM is procedural and really shouldn't take any more than um, somewhere between uh, 30 to maybe 90 minutes to get through. Nonprofit organizations can also hold what's generally known as special general meetings. Within the BC Societies Act, they may simply be called general meetings. They are simply called general meetings, excuse me. Directors of the society may call a general meeting anytime as described in your organization's bylaws. Members may also call a general, um, a general meeting and the requirements on how to do this will exist in your bylaws as well. The BC Societies Act states that 10% of the voting members of a society may file a requisition. This requisition must contain the names and signatures of those voting members and must detail the business to be considered at the meeting, including the resolution to be considered or resolutions to be considered, and then submitted to the organization's office and to each of the directors of the board. Regardless of how the meeting is instigated, a call for a general meeting must be issued by written notice at least 14 days in advance and not more than 60 days in advance. Written notice must include the date and time, and if applicable, the location of the meeting. Uh, the text of any special resolution must be submitted in written notice. Like with AGMs, your bylaws will outline the rules that your organization must follow to hold a general meeting, and if they do not, you must follow provincial nonprofit legislation. A general meeting is used to satisfy urgent business, which needs attending to by the membership, or a non-urgent member uh, matter that requires the whole meeting to discuss it. People must know what the general meeting has been called for. For that reason, the topic of the general meeting must be outlined in the written notice and any resolutions being proposed must be included. There is no opportunity to add additional business to a general meeting at that meeting if it has not already been included in that written notice. This is to protect the interests of the members who are not in attendance. If your organization uses general meetings, it's a good idea to read provincial nonprofit legislation, no matter how dry that is, or refer to Robert's Rules of Order, which we'll talk about shortly, or consult a lawyer to ensure that what you're doing is legal and fair. Next, we'll talk about board meetings. A board meeting is a formal meeting of the board of directors of an organization and any invited guests held at regular intervals. Some nonprofit legislation outlines that boards must meet a minimum of four times per year. I didn't see that in the BC Societies Act, but I know, for instance, that that is within the Saskatchewan Nonprofit Act. Other organizations choose to meet every second month or monthly. Board meetings should review performance, receive reports from committee and staff, review and update policy, influence strategy, oversee management, and guard against undue risks or compliance violations. The meeting should be chaired by someone who facilitates the meeting. The roles and responsibilities of the chair will be outlined in your bylaws and governance policies, as well as the process for your meetings. Establishing rules for board meetings helps to, by providing a structure that people will understand, and it offers flexibility in a transition where someone new um, uh, potentially on a short-term basis or on a permanent basis, steps in as chair. At a board meeting, a, an agenda would typically look like a call to order by the chair, a welcome and any introductions, again, like an AGM, 
a review of the meeting code of conduct and a call to declare conflicts of interest, both of which I'll speak more of later. The board will approve the agenda and the previous meeting minutes. Next, the board would review or discuss committee and staff reports and attend to ongoing business, such as review of policy or review of its risk registry, both of which we talked about last um, in the last webinar. Then the board would move on to any old business before then addressing any new business. Finally, the board will hold its in-camera session and adjourn. An in-camera session is Latin for in-chambers, and it means to go into a confidential or secret session. Whatever is discussed in-camera cannot leave the metaphorical or physical room. There would typically be, this would typically be where you would discuss any confidential issues or matters related to staff um, who typically join your meeting. Only board members attend this period. Um, so that's no lawyers, no staff, no guests, no one else. No notes are taken, but anything that requires action must have motions made once the group comes out of in-camera. It is a best practice to go in-camera every session of the board, even for a brief period of time to ask if there's anything to discuss and if there isn't to move on out in case um, so that so that people are prepared and understand what in camera is used for. And um, also you eliminate anxiety of staff if you haven't gone into an in camera in nine months and all of a sudden you're going in. They might say, uh, what did I do? Was my job at risk? So this is the type of thing we want to eliminate. For boards and committees, unless stated in the bylaws, the quorum is a majority of the members. Okay, committee meetings. Committee meetings are for the subgroups of people who come together to fill a predetermined function, what we discussed um, in the first session. Committee meetings occur around the meetings of the board so that the committees can report back to the board and the board can take action at their meetings. Committees do not generally make their own decisions. They research and prepare plans and undertake due diligence and then make recommendations back to the board for the board to approve. It can be a wise idea to provide a framework for committees to use, including policy or terms of reference for how they operate, how often to meet, what their quorum and voting structure looks like, what work they're responsible for, and what decisions they can or cannot make. In this way, you have consistency across all of your committees, and you can ensure that committees are not duplicating work and that no one is going rogue. Personally, I prefer committee meetings that are a maximum of 90 minutes. I prefer to meet more often and do concentrated bursts of work over having one marathon meeting, particularly if this is after I've worked all day. Others prefer one long meeting and get everything done in one shot. I don't have a lot of guidance um, further about this topic, um, other than to say that those chairing committee meetings should do their best to work with their community committee members to find a working format that fits the best for everyone in the group in order to ensure that everyone remains happy and productive while doing the work of the committee. Okay, next let's move on to meeting protocols, which can be used in all sorts of meetings. Many organizations use parliamentary procedures or meeting protocols to ensure that meetings are managed effectively. There are some benefits to using parliamentary procedures. First, there is an assurance of all uh, members' equal rights, privileges, and obligations. All it should be important to all of us. The protocols laid out ensure that everyone is treated the same, that everyone has the same opportunities, that their privileges according to the bylaws are recognized, and that they fill their responsibilities for participation. Of course, this depends on the different classes of members that an organization has and the rights and privileges of those classes. So I'm not saying that everyone carte blanche gets the right to vote if their membership um, uh, classification does not allow them to do so. The second benefit of using meeting protocols is that parliamentary procedure ensures that everyone will be treated respectfully and cordially. Parliamentary procedures ensure that there is consideration of one item at a time through the series and priorities of motions. Uh, 
and through the other parameters laid out for discussion. Meeting protocols allow for the ability of all sides to provide input, including those who support motions and those who oppose those motions. Finally, after structured debate uh, and discussion, everyone has the right, um, who, ha who has the right to vote, has the opportunity to vote, and the majority rule decides the result. Finally, the four fundamentals of parliamentary law are, number one, to facilitate action and not obstruct it. Number two, to, to enable the assembly to ex express its will. Number three, to give every member a fair hearing. And number four, to maintain order. There are several different um, types of parliamentary protocols, but perhaps the most commonly known is Robert's Rules of Order. Henry Martin Roberts was an engineering officer in the American Army. He was asked to provide, preside over a public meeting in his community on short notice and realized that he didn't know how, and he was quite embarrassed, according to the website. Uh, after that, he was determined to educate himself, and as he did, he saw a need for others to learn parliamentary procedure as well. Now, in its 12th edition, the Roberts Rules of Order are commonly recognized as a guide to smoothly, orderly, and fairly conduct meetings where everyone can hear and be heard. It helps groups keep order while getting business done and resolve any issues that may arise along the way. Roberts Rules has a robust detailing of rules for practically every component of the governing organization. It details how you proceed through a variety of situations and offers interpretations to scenarios and questions. It's a highly detailed document. The book is over 700 pages. Oh, I had my note. I put it away. Um, and people spend their careers learning and understanding these rules and working with client organizations to interpret those rules properly. There are many free resources online. I found several resources on YouTube, which I referenced to build this presentation. And there are courses you can take, which I have, um, to learn more about Robert's Rules of Order. But uh, if you prefer to skip that, you can also hire parliamentarians to consult or to provide expert advice at your meetings. A very fundamental process to approving business is to make a motion. A motion is a formal proposal to bring a subject before an assembly for its consideration and action. A motion begins by a member raising their hand, being acknowledged by the chairperson, and saying, I move that, followed by what the motion is. The chair then asks someone to raise their hand to second the motion. It's important to note that when you second a motion, you are not agreeing or supporting that motion, but instead you're agreeing that the subject should be discussed. To second a motion, you would then raise your hand and say second, or I second the motion. The chairperson then restates the motion by saying there is a motion to and restates the motion. This then opens up the discussion. The chair should control the discussion by acknowledging individuals before they speak. Every individual now has the opportunity to speak, and every individual should be provided the opportunity to speak, should they wish, before any one person speaks a second or a subsequent time, however many times that takes. This discussion is not meant to be a conversation. It's meant to be a debate amongst members. When the discussion has waned, the chair will then restate the motion a third time and ask all those in favor to raise their hand, followed by all those who are not in favor. The chair will not count the votes one by one, but instead will assess numbers by observing the number of hands in the air. Upon determining the decision, the chair will announce the vote um, or the result of the vote, I should say, by saying carried or defeated or lost. At any point during the discussion, a member may make a motion to amend the motion on the table. This could include striking out words, inserting or adding words, striking out words and inserting others in their place, or substituting one paragraph for another if it's lengthy motion. If a motion is proposed, it must be voted on before the original 
motion can be voted, then voted on. There's 13 different types of motions, which much must go in order, uh, according to the parliamentary procedure. So refer to Robert's rules if you'd like to learn about them further. It's important to note that there are certain instances where a simple majority of votes is required. A simple majority is more than half of the members and is often expressed as 50% plus one. But there are times when a two thirds majority is required, which is literally 66% of the votes. A two thirds vote is meant to balance the rights of the entire group with the rights of the individuals so that some decisions require the affirmative consent of at least twice the number of members as those not in favor. This means only the number of the votes cast, not the number of the votes that could be cast if everyone were able to vote, because that would be a heady beast. According to Robert's rules, a two thirds vote is required to suspend or change a rule already adopted, to close or limit debate on a motion, to prevent the consideration of a motion, or to close nominations or polls. It's for this reason that amendments to bylaws must pass with a two thirds majority. So regarding parliamentary procedure, here's a few other common things to consider. First, as I mentioned previously, quorum must be present for business to be done. If a meeting does not have quorum, motions cannot be made or decided on. Quorum is essential to ensure that decisions represent the group fairly. Second, because we all are re relatively small and informal organizations, discussion doesn't have to occur only once a motion and a second has been made. For many of you, um, discussion uh, can and I'm sure has occurred before the motion is made, and that's totally fine. Next, it's important to understand which things are approved and which things do not need motions but are simply received. For instance, bylaws, rules, resolutions, budgets, and audits must be approved, while reports, on the other hand, should simply be filed. If you make a motion to accept reports, this means that you approve of what is in the report as it is presented, which may not actually be the case. Instead, they should simply be read and filed. And if there are recommendations or resolutions to come out of those reports, they should be each motioned and voted on separately. It's for this reason that the treasurer's report should also be received and filed. Finally, motions um, should be recorded in the minutes as adopted or lost so that you and future iterations of boards or committees know exactly who uh, or what the result of the vote was. Okay, we've reached the third section now. So let's turn our attention to the tips for effective meeting management. In preparation for this webinar, I reached out to my network on LinkedIn and crowdsourced some of people's top tips for managing effective meetings. And those tips have been incorporated into the section. First, let's consider building the agenda by starting with, is this meeting really necessary? As employees, I'm sure we have all encountered a fair few meetings in our work lives where we felt this could have been an email. <laughs> Before booking a meeting, consider, do we really need to meet? If the answer is, hmm, maybe not, rethink moving ahead. And I think that is um, something we can take back into our work lives as well. Next, we should consider several facets of timing when building an agenda such as when will this meeting be held? Will this meeting be held during evenings after people attend full days of work and feed their families and then get them off to activities? Or will you choose weekends after people have already worked full work weeks? Um, or is this meeting over some people's holidays or um, family dinner time uh, on Sundays perhaps? This past fall, I worked with a provincial volleyball organization to develop their strategic plan we spoke at length about when it would be best to hold the virtual planning meetings that we wanted to hold. We decided Sundays um, 
were going to be our choice because it was people's only free night during the high school volleyball season between weekday league and weekend tournaments. In the end, our timing selection was poor because people were tired after hectic weeks and they had little more to give. Everyone was on fumes. Um, So hindsight being what it is, it could have been better to develop a strategic plan after the high school season had wrapped up at the end of November. Um, But then you're bumping into Christmas and after Christmas, that's when the club season starts. So there's always something. So we need to consider how much, um, when we're going to place our meetings in schedules. Then we need to consider how much work, uh, how much time do we really need? Often people book an hour um, or a day or a weekend because it's a nice round amount of time. I would suggest critically considering how much time the items on the agenda will take um, by including this time estimate on the agenda. So this is something that uh, currently I sit as vice chair on the board I sit on. Uh, The chair and I and our executive director consider this in building our agenda. This will help you accurately budget the time of the meeting and you may discover you only need 90 minutes instead of two hours or 75 minutes instead um, instead of 90 minutes or perhaps 45 instead of an hour. So be realistic with your time estimates for each agenda item, but don't schedule an excess, uh, an abundant excess of time. By scheduling slightly less time than you need and including this time on the agenda, it signals to people that item A is not meant to be a long discussion, while item B is likely to be a more in-depth discussion. It's like a subliminal message that let's move it along. This was only meant to be five minutes. Another thing to consider when you've established the time that agenda items will take is that sometimes the board doesn't get through everything on the agenda. It's happened to boards I've sat on, committees I've sat on for sure. Putting an important item later increases a risk that it could get cut short or deferred altogether. As well, decision fatigue is a huge deal, especially at this point in the pandemic um, or given what's happening in our society right now. As we make decisions throughout the day, our capacity to make more decisions and complex decisions wears out. We can avoid this by scheduling important items first, which means that the board tackles them when their decision-making abilities are at their best. So even though you might have a standard agenda, a order of what you use, if you have a very significant uh, discussion to be had, Perhaps you consider shifting the agenda items around to make that the first and foremost thing to get that out of the way so you've used your best thinking time on the thing that needs the most attention. The last thing you should give consideration to when building an agenda is to consider who needs to be there and invite only those people. One person in my network shared that they are a partner with a community organization where they have to give updates at their meetings and they are always scheduled for the end of the meeting. Because the meeting, the organization does not include time estimates on their agendas, he's forced to arrive at the beginning of the meeting and he has to sit through at least an hour of things that do not pertain to him. His updates take 10 minutes or less and he leaves every meeting feeling frustrated that his previous hour plus has been wasted. So if you're inviting guests, give them time a time to arrive or place them at the beginning of the agenda so they can leave them when their item is done. That's simply just considerate. Finally, what should be on an agenda? The agenda should include a short description of the meeting objectives. And I would say this is especially important if this is not a regularly occurring meeting. It should include the meeting's participants, the meeting time, the length, and the location. It could also, or it should also include the topics that will be covered uh, as agenda items, the timing of those items, and who will lead those items. It should also be accompanied by or followed um, shortly by the meeting package. Next, let's consider the days leading up to the meeting. Provide people with advance notice of the meeting. Where possible, provide ample time. In some cases, your bylaws or policies will dictate how much time um, 
or notice needs to be given. If it doesn't, try to give people two weeks of notice so they can juggle their calendars. I would suggest even three. This is important so that you can send out the meeting package in advance. The meeting package should go, I feel, at least one week in advance. This gives people time to read the package and percolate on the contents. The meeting package should include things like previous meeting minutes, financials, correspondence, and reports. Reports should be written and submitted in advance of meetings, and they should contain enough detail to, so that people understand the meanings and the backgrounds of recommendations given. It, uh, to get good results out of a board meeting, each member should uh, of the meeting should read and understand the information they need so that they can confidently prepare and participate in the meeting and be prepared for the decisions ahead. Um, when we think back to fiduciary duties and responsibilities of a board, this is, I think, an essential component of that is to make sure that we have all the information we need and to give considerable time to make those decisions. So when effective decision making is backed up by data and facts, um, oh, I, excuse me. While a, a effective dis, ooh, wow, while effective decision meeting making is backed up by data and facts, this does not have to be ex exhaustive detail. The board needs to information at a level that will help inform the decision and trigger questions, and they need it before the meeting so that you can um, focus on the discussion at the meeting. Okay. When I moved into this work of facilitating workshops and sessions for people, I was given the advice, always, always, always be the first person in the room and greet each person by name when they arrive. It helps to build a personal connection with attendees and it helps with name retention as well, which I'm not great at. It's, um, I think it's a good piece of advice and it's good advice even if you're a small group who all know each other. It extends a personal connection with each person you're working with. Next, I would say extremely important, start on time. When I, when I say on time, I mean at the precise minute the meeting is supposed to start. Over the last two years of virtual meetings, we've heard time and time again, let's give people one or two more minutes to get logged on. However, this signals that arriving on time isn't important or a priority for this group and we'll start whenever people choose to arrive. Instead, we should reward and respect those who chose to arrive on time. And, um, and I think that's just really a considerate and respectful thing to do. On the other hand, I feel it's important to rarely, if ever, take more time than has been designated for a meeting. If we don't need all of the time we've scheduled, awesome. We'll get um, a gift of a few more minutes in our calendar. But if we go over time, people start to get antsy and annoyed. Um, they check out or they drop off to go somewhere else to another call. Um, and the conversation loses its pro productivity. Finally, again, considering personal connections, allow space to catch up. By, uh, but, but be meaningful in how you do this. For instance, say to the group, we're going to go one moment yeah okay for instance say to the group we're going to go clockwise clockwise around the table and each provide an update please take two minutes to share one positive thing that has happened since we've met last now people know that they get to share something but they only have uh they only have time to share one thing they know they have roughly two minutes to share and they know who will go next. That eliminates lag time between deciding who comes up next. Or you could pick something slightly more whimsical, like um, as we do our introductions. Okay. I had an awesome graphic for this. I don't know what happened to it. Um, as Or pick slightly something more whimsical, like as we do our introductions, tell us what you did on your 16th birthday which is, uh, I was just at a meeting recently and someone did this and I thought, well, that's cute. Everyone has had a 16th birthday and it will infuse some lightness into the room as people recall their teenage years. 
If you're holding a meeting virtually, um, you could also tell people they have 20 seconds to find an object in their surroundings that represents something uh, that they enjoyed from the last week. Then tell people who will go and who will go next. For instance, um, Gabe will go, David will be next. People will be prepared then to unmute themselves and there will be less dead time as you work through the group. That's three ideas I have, um, but there's a multitude of icebreakers on the internet. In a short amount of time, you've infused um, some connections for your group personally, you've built some rapport, maybe had some laughs, and now there's positive energy in the room as you start to get into the work. During the meeting, stick to the agenda. If other things come up that weren't on the agenda, add them to the parking lot. If there is time left over at the end of the meeting, tackle those things then. If not, then you will be sure to have them added to the next meeting um, to be addressed. They won't be lost. A second idea is to use a consent agenda. A consent agenda gives the group an expedient way to quickly complete the formal legal approvals and get on to more interesting topics. It groups the routine, procedural, informational, and self-explanatory non-controversial items together, um, typically found on an agenda. During the meeting, you then ask the board to approve all the items on the consent agenda with a single motion. Anything that needs more discussion can be removed from the consent agenda and, as, and then discussed as required. A consent agenda should be part of your governance policies if you're going to use it. Um, but, and they're a good way to move things forward. So if you um, don't have that in policy, that's definitely something you could add. The chairperson should control the meeting by being the facilitator and acknowledging people before they speak. This helps the control, uh, to control the flow of information and ensure that everyone has an opportunity to speak should they wish to, and keeps the conversation balanced and not dominated by certain individuals. As well, the chairperson should step in and bring people back to the agenda if they get off track. And we know they do. I'm as guilty as anyone for going off track. Um, so this includes stop this also includes stopping anyone who interrupts another person. This um, it's so there, therefore, it's important to call out rude um, and stop rude discourteous and personal remarks and ensures that discussion remains positive and focused on the topic at hand. Earlier, I said that reports should be included in the meeting package for everyone to read beforehand and that reports should provide enough information for people to adequately understand what is being done and how decisions are being made. During the meeting then, the report shouldn't be read but instead discussed as required. For the board that I sit on, we have four committees and one task force. At the start of our last fiscal year, which was last July, we made the decision slash commitment as a board to transition from oral reports to pre-submitted written reports. Confidently, I can say that we save ourselves upwards of 45 minutes each meeting because we're spending time discussing the important elements of the report instead of hearing... <laughs> a disorganized rambling account of what's gone on um, that potentially is missing details. This change has absolutely been worth it. As well, two years ago, we made a change from reviewing and monitoring policy together as a board at meetings to the governance committee preparing the work and submitting the changes for the board's review. This has saved hours of our time. Our meetings used to be upwards of eight hours, and between these two changes, our, our last meeting, which we had just a few short weeks ago, was four hours, the fastest we've ever met. It was excellent. We've cut our meeting time in half. And I would argue that our, we're governing our organization much, much better because of it. So consider making this change for your organization if oral reports is something that you do. Ensure that someone is taking minutes it can help to build an organizational template that is used consistently across the board and the committees to give guidance on the information to be kept, include the date, meeting time, the attendees and the absentees. When describing each item on the agenda, write a short statement of the actions taken 
an explanation for the decision and any arguments made against it. All records should re remain objective with clear language so anyone reading the minutes understands what was accomplished during the meetings. But don't include a running dialogue of conversation. Boards and committee discussions should be confidential and decisions should be made, uh, should be done so with one voice. Protect um, those who volunteer for your organization by ensuring that reprisal is not possible if meeting minutes were to be made public. Lastly, make sure that you celebrate your organization's successes. We're always striving to improve our organizations and often we focus on our deficiencies so that we can improve them, but that can take a toll on our energy and our collective excitement. Make sure that you celebrate your organization's progress and successes no matter how small they are. Progress is progress. So maybe that looks like adding that as a standing item on your agenda. Oh, here's my cute graphics in the totally wrong place. Awesome, okay. So a note about managing group dynamics. The board I sit on has a meeting code of conduct. Each board member takes turn reading it at the beginning of each meeting. It reminds us each time of the commitments that we make to each other to speak respectfully, to think critically, and to uphold our responsibilities of, an organiza of the organization. Next, our chair asks if anyone has a conflict of interest to declare based on the meeting's agenda. This provides us with opportunity to voluntarily declare if we are in conflict or to discuss whether we are or aren't. And again, reminds us that we need to do our best to minimize perceived or actual conflicts of interest. It also builds a culture that we can revisit at any point through the meeting if we feel that we ourselves or others are in conflict. And it moves the discussion from accusatory to explorative. I previously mentioned this before, but I think it's important enough to say again, ensure that everyone has the space to speak. Some individuals need processing time, are introverted, or are naturally quieter. Your chair should balance the discussion with those that naturally speak up by allowing conversation to start and then asking for opinions of those directly who have not contributed yet. Often they will appreciate the space and they will take the opportunity. Finally, determine the decision-making format, make everyone aware of that format and continue to reinforce it. Someone in my network suggested that people should strive for consensus, but where consensus isn't possible, to use majority vote. Once decisions are made, everyone should commit to those decisions because it is followed, it, because it followed the decision-making format and everyone pr was provided the opportunity to weigh in, even if the decision wasn't the one that they would choose. At the end of your meeting or post-meeting, give a sincere thanks to everyone that attended your meeting and contributed their time and thoughtfulness. Sincere thanks are one form of recognition that people often appreciate. Second, implement a tool for evaluating your meeting. With the board I sit on, we used to send this tool, uh, which is attached here, um, out to people following the meeting, but we didn't always receive responses or good responses. Now we take time at the end of the meeting to have an open conversation to ensure that we are achieving what we need to out of the meeting. So um, as you can see here, we ask six short questions. We each share what we felt was most important topic of the meeting. We write down the agenda items that require follow-up. We each share if we feel there's any important information that was missed during the meeting. And then we personally share what we learned from the meeting and we provide a one to five finger ranking on whether we feel, felt that reporting is taking place in alignment with the organization's policies and goals and whether we feel that that meeting was a good use of the board's time. Um, and certainly those haven't always been fives from everyone. Then we can follow up or we can improve, improve as needed. The whole process takes us 10 minutes or less if you can work together. Um, so I would suggest that is a very effective tool to add uh, collaboration and transparency to your process. 
Um, if you can, work together to pick the next meeting time or send out a poll to collect availability on the next meeting time. Send the draft meeting minutes and complete any follow-up from the meeting as required. And then the process is set and you can start all over again. 